Hi, so um, hi, Claire, thank you for joining me. Um, welcome to New Foundation Farms. Could you give us a brief rundown of uh, how you've ended up here? Um, well, yes, I can. Hi, Glenn, nice to see you. Um, so I grew up, my um, parents both worked, worked in agriculture. My dad was a farm manager and my mum a farm secretary on different farms. So I grew up kind of around farming, but we didn't, for the most part of my childhood, we didn't grow up on, we weren't living on the farm that my dad was working on. Um, so it's like in the background, but it wasn't kind of like a key part, of, a part of my life. But my 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 family are farmers by training and or by by trade, and my on on my mum's side. Um, but I think my my auntie described it to me the other week as like you're the descendant of the third and fourth children, which means that often, of course, the first child traditionally inherits um, inherits the land, and then um, and I think I think that's what happened. So um, although part of a line of farmers, I haven't I didn't wasn't kind of exposed to it so much when when I was growing up, and I never really had much interest to be honest. Um, and it was when I um, well, I was always interested in the outdoors, and I was into horses and stuff, and then I. Um, I decided to uh, do a course on environmental management at Bishop Burton. And I think that was what that was what then I, as part of that, I kind of engaged with um, with 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 agriculture through that side and then um, took a year out and went to Australia to work on farms because I wanted to go to Harper Adams, but I couldn't go because I didn't have any farm experience. So did a year in Australia and that gave me my farm experience to be able to to be able to go to Harper. So that was my kind of um, growing up version of it. And then um and then from there, after I graduated, I did agriculture. I started doing agriculture and environmental management. And um, I remember saying, like, right back in the early days, that, that what I wanted to do one day would be to bring the two things together, environment and farming somehow, and, and help farmers. And then it's taken me a while to get there. But finally, that's where I find, my, find myself actually doing it, um, which, which is really nice. Um um so I and then but I but then someone said to me yeah there's no money in environmental jobs well a few people quite a few people said that you don't want to do anything to do with the environment like you'll never get a job and there'll be no money if you do get a job so I switched to agriculture with marketing um so I kind of did I did marketing as part of my course but that was actually really good because it taught me about consumer behavior and a lot of other things that have be, become really really useful um, and then after graduating of kind of my, my stretch runs through, um, worked for Red Tractor, worked for the National Fallen Stock Scheme, worked for the National Farmers Union, um, then to Sainsbury's um, as agriculture manager there um, and also for FAI Farms and FAI had a few stints there. So as a, a placement from university, I did there working on the poultry side and that really got me interested actually in those um pig and poultry side of things whereas most people when you're talking about farming most people are interested in cows <laughs> cows and tractors um and so that got me interested in pigs and poultry um and then that, that's what i did actually at sainsbury's i was the agriculture manager for pigs and poultry um and then um so sorry and then and dalesford as well so from sainsbury's to dalesford as the, as the meat buyer there for a few years um and then um and then to to fai farms um working with 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 clients like McDonald's, Marks and Spencer, IKEA on their food sustainability and animal welfare programs, um, and then whilst at FAI was when I had my big like regenerative farming overhaul, I guess, um, and and now I still do some work with FAI, but also mainly focused on plant and farm and new foundation farms. Amazing. So that's quite a kind of varied career but what's interesting is you've been on both sides of the fence as it were um which i find really fascinating you've worked for the big guys who would be buying you've also worked as a buyer and then you've worked on the agriculture side so i would imagine that's that's a, not many people have that kind of overall view of the entire supply chain and the problems on either end of it i would think because i'd think that working for someone like sainsbury's there's a certain expectation that might not match up with the expectation of the farmer supplying them and you you understand both of those sides yeah i um yeah i guess when you describe it like that yeah it sounds it sounds quite good doesn't it yeah i think uh so my role at sainsbury's was very much about developing relationship with farmers and setting up the development groups um that that, that still exist now and working on welfare standards and the commitments they had at the time which was 20 sustainability commitments by 2020 which um 
don't appear to be there anymore. But anyway, uh, we uh, yeah. So so it, no, it was a really good insight. It was a really good insight in what the pressures are, what the demands are, how the interactions currently work. That retailer supplier intera- interaction, and I kind of knew that from a farmer side, like when you're supplying into uh, into one of the um, meat companies, and then ha- yeah, seeing the interaction and how how that worked. Um, and there also just things like. Um, lots of commitments get made by big companies and they're brilliant some of them um and but but yet what doesn't happen so the sustainability team manage that or the agriculture team manage that and that was great but then it only goes so far because the people with the purse strings the people buying the product um are not given the budget or the targets to actually change the way they source to back that up. So you might have a commitment for everything to be high welfare chicken, for example, but your chicken buyer is given no more budget in which to work with. And their own targets are not, um, you know, not aligned either. And when people go into a buying type role, they get a certain type of training. It's all focused on hard negotiation and they are rewarded based on their negotiation skills and the amount of money that they're able to save whatever the business is uh, every year. And that, that 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 doesn't always, very often doesn't align with what we're trying to do when we're looking for a different paradigm of a food system. Yeah, that's really interesting because you, you mentioned a few bits there, which um, when I talked to Caroline as well, she brought up is like within within the big supply chains, there's a lot of will to do good and to do better. And it comes down to KPIs of the person above quite often. Um, and there's this, this tension between um, organizations wanting to do things better, but then also not being able to, because when things are done better, they ought to cost a bit more. Um, but something I'd like to pick up on, it, you mentioned some brands that people might find surprising or interested in looking at Regen, um, being Arla, Ikea, and McDonald's um what what was the sort of scope of work what, what what were those those huge brands what were they looking at and what were they trying to achieve by the work you were doing with them um well so to, to pick them up individually because they've each each you know every, everybody has their own context so they've actually they've actually got different you know different reasons but with, with McDonald's um you know what is McDonald's without a burger and so um you know beef is a, a huge focus area for them and um the 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 pressures that come on ruminants from the world of plant-based and the world uh, you know um, uh, the the pressure that comes about methane emissions that one thing that gets singled out um well what does that look like well the solution to many of the problems that we have on beef just on that one one product is is around a more regenerative system and beef is something that's fairly easy to transition so um they they um um, ha- have been pioneering, I guess, in trialing um, regenerative grazing of beef systems um, in in the UK, um, and 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 IKEA would be a great one because they are a f- actually a really big food business that maybe people don't realise. If you don't go to IKEA regularly, you you of course we all know about the furniture, but maybe don't appreciate the size and scale of the of the of the of the cafeterias that they have there yep. and the volume of food. They're actually quite a large restaurant chain <laughs> when 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 you put them up there, and. Um, and 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 they are a still family owned business that very much have an aspiration to want to do the right thing and their impact across all of the multiple products that they're sourcing is huge um yeah. and so for them it's like how in the world do we where do we even start and what, what can we bring but there's always they've always had a sort of focus on sustainability on the furniture side so now it's what does that look like on food um and and with Arla um it's you know one of the first one of the principle, if you if you depending on your set of principles that you abide to when you're talking about um, re- regenerative farming, then one of them is always integration of livestock. And of course, we have integration of livestock with dairy farming, but it's not necessarily regenerating. Um, and so how do we redress the balance on that? And um, dairy comes under a lot of criticism um, from many angles, um, but but has some good stories to tell if done right. It, the classic it's the it's the how not the cow so for them it's about finding their how and all are uh, um interesting because they're they're farmer owned so they don't have they don't have some of the corporate oh, structure maybe yeah. um and, and the shareholders are farmers so everything that's done is with interest for, 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 for all the farmers so um yeah that's that's a, that's an interesting one to work with as well so I'm, I'm going to ask the chicken and egg question now so um you're working for these brands um, in 
in the guys to helping them understand how they can be at least reduce impact, if not become regenerative to certain aspects of their supply chain. So for you, what, what came first? Was it, was it the working for the big brands, asking the questions, or did you already have a, an inkling to, to think that you wanted to be involved in things that were more sustainable and ethical and regenerative? Um, or, or did the two kind of evolve together? How, how, what was your sort of, yeah, where did your awareness grow from? Was it from, from studying environmental management? How, how did all that tie together? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it was a few different things collided at the same time. Um, and um, so my kind of, well, I guess my kind of feeling that things in the current system weren't working, like that just lo lots of little examples kept 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 coming up. And then, uh, um, and then there was a bit of interest in 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 regenerative agriculture. But so I say we we drove a lot of that ourselves actually. So you know, our role at FAI is to put the you know, horizon scan and bring the pressing issues to um to to the brands, and that was our role. And 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 so we pushed the projects um to to get them to get them over the line because they are the right thing to do. And of course, once you put it in front of people, they go, oh, yeah, no, we should be doing this. Or they've started to talk about regenerative agriculture, but don't know what that means. And then we've, we've helped them unpick it. So I would say that it it, it came from my own kind of unpicking of um, maybe the food system um, isn't, well, it's not working. Um, a lot a lot of our systems aren't working. And um, and, and I started, sorry, and picked that for myself and then thought, well, how can I use big brands um as one of the routes to you know in, in, in bring about change um but what i also what i also came to realize is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to tweak an existing system and and right. the, that 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 whole scale change isn't as far as i can see isn't going to happen um there and we need alternatives we, we can't just keep um, trying to fix a system that doesn't work very well anymore. Um, I saw the piece of work that came out last week that said the top big five big you know industries in the world, if if had to play their true costs of the environmental costs of what they do, would all be bankrupt. So just by the nature of that, we're working with broken models. Um, and so we also need, but it's no good to just keep saying um no good to just keep saying the model's broken or it's not working very well uh you know let, let, it, we need a new one and a different one and i guess that was when that like, that's what that's what led me to new foundation farms because it was like brilliant this this is a, a new model a new way of doing a new way of being a new way of interacting a new way of viewing food and a new way of combining food and health as it should be as 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 one thing and and um and so this is what I want to work on. This is how I see the future. And then I'll still dedicate some of my time to helping the existing paradigm shift because that is important because one thing that we, I feel that we don't have is lots of time. We need pace everywhere. So anything I can do to bring, bring about a change of pace. So just to sort of summarize what you've just said there, you, within the system, obviously there is change that needs to happen, but that can only go so far. So you've hit a point of realizing that, Yes, we need to change the the current paradigm, and we need to make that as sustainable and low impact as possible. But but essentially, that will be a cul de sac. We'll hit a point where, with the current way of doing things, we can't improve anymore, and therefore, we also need a radically different system to act as an alternative. So you're kind of splitting your time between developing the radical alternative system, which is New Foundation, and working within the current system to try and make it better while we get there. But, yeah. But eventually. <laughs> without putting words into your mouth, you want to get to a point where the new system proves its worth well beyond the old system and everything shifts over. Mm -hmm. That That's okay. exactly, that, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, that's it, 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 it. We need a new, a new normal. Um, and, 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 and yeah, and uh, that radically natural, that, that phrase I love so much about working with new foundation farms, it is radical and it's different. And often people are scared of that. Um, but I, that's great. We need people to be scared and and it to be a really disruptive not because we want to be disruptive to be difficult because we can envisage uh you know a, a system that is better for everybody involved within it so it won't have a handful of shareholders at the top that are going to really benefit financially but what it does have is brings good for all and of course the current models are in our food system are based on in the main a few individuals that benefit massively financially but everything else is not benefiting the people the animals the environment the planet the water systems everything involved in it is not benefiting um and and, and any target that's been set to try and reduce harm as far as i can see in the last 
10 years of really working in detail on this stuff has either been erased off people's websites or the situation has got worse, not better. Wow, that's a powerful comment. Yeah. Um, yeah, that really is. That, that, that's quite terrifying. It, at, at the end of the day, the bottom line kind of wins out on everything, um, which is, yeah, where it comes to. Um, something I'd like to pick up on. Um, when we were talking before we started recording, you, you told me about an incident um, that kind of led you to a more holistic way of thinking about agriculture. Um, could, you, could you tell us about that? Tell me about that again. And it, yeah. was, it, it was involving, I think, um, really bad weather and some lambs. And I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you go from there. But I think there's a really important aspect of that is it, when, when, we were, uh, when we were talking before this call, you said that, that it kind of triggered you to stop thinking in a reductionist way and to think in a bigger picture way. But um, please, yeah, tell, tell, tell that in your own words. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had, um, there wasn't this like one moment, often people have this like light bulb and they, I had like this compounding effect of different things, mostly things that were going wrong that led me to be like, hey, how, how is it this hard? It, we're, we're doing one of the most fundamental jobs on the planet. We're, we're, we're producing food and it is so hard. And, um, and, and should it, should it be that way? And yet my, my, my example, um, we were, I was running the farm FAI and and I'd ha I had my own sheep flock um, and we'd been very focused on data recording and you know absolutely right we understand every little bit about every animal but of course now I realize we were only really ever recording 10 parameters you know um, focused on production and, and and increasing production and increasing efficiency we, you know all brilliant and, and recording everything and as part of that in a sheep flock that means um, recording details about animals um, born and, and at birth how much they weigh um, how easy the lambing was um, all of it really good data but what it also involves is um, ear, yeah, ear tagging animals at 24 hours old so that you've got a record of that animal and you can keep all that data against it and it was the the year of the beast from the east so beast from the east had passed but the water the the the, the, the melting of the snow and the rain that came after was just unprecedented and it was so wet for weeks and we were having even on um even on normal fields we we're having lambs born into a few inches of water on the ground it was just so saturated and it was really miserable and um the guys i was working with were coming to me and saying we've got to stop tagging you know it's just it's too difficult it's too wet and they're it, it's you know creating some health problems but I was like I was so torn because but but the data is so important and if we don't get the data now we won't have it through the rest of the flock and then um you know we're not going to be able to do all the analysis to make all the good decisions but like everything and, and every ounce in me like instinctively was saying the right thing to do is to just let this go take the stress off the people take the stress off the animals but it's like no 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 we have to have the data it's so important and um and I, and I I made them carry on for another few days and then I could see it was just breaking people so I yeah okay let it go and I just felt bad and that I'd failed as a good manager because I hadn't managed to keep the team together to keep recording all the data and um and but but I just definitely stood there in in the rain pouring and just thinking I, I i yeah this is how does it being so hard we're trying to do the right thing we're following what everybody's telling us is the right thing to do and this is so hard um and and it and it and, and it need and, and it feels like it shouldn't have to be so that was that was one moment where i realized that yeah we were recording this data but we were inflicting a lot of time and stress on people at lambing and we were tagging animals at 24 hours old, which does sometimes lead to some infection problems. If it, 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 and, and, um, and I was like, is it, is it really worth it? Like, are we getting the gains? Because are we really, yeah, are we really getting the gains? And I don't know if, I don't know if this is worth it. That was the first time I questioned the sort of, yeah, in, insistence on data collection all the time. And that being the answer, it's not that I'm anti-data, but it's like that's put up as the answer. If we just had more data, everything would be better if we had more data. That seems to be the the kind of words of the moment. But what is interesting though, as you're talking about it, is that I picked up on, it seemed like, the the important mind shift was that you questioned how things were traditionally done probably possibly for the first time it's like you you you, had, you went into the task with a mindset that it has to be done and then questioned the validity of, of that previous assumption does it have to be done um and and that sounds like it was it was quite you know quite a transformative once you start questioning the system you're then open to question it in all other areas 
exactly and that's what happened yeah that that's what then happened um got, it, I guess reached a really low point there and then um and then started to quit well because then I saw the relief of everyone on the team and then I saw that okay we didn't have all the data from the lambing but it was okay and we still went through and everything was fine and um you, you know and 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 the, so then I was like oh wow and, and so yeah that that it, it did and then the, the next thing that was sort of happening in parallel which is the the other odd one that most people don't talk about it but it seems to be one of my stories um was the was the rats one um rats. whereby <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Where we um so this was like came shortly afterwards was um we we got chickens on the farm and the farm in Oxford it's close to um it's close to the river it's on the River Thames and it's only like a mile as the, or a mile and a half as the crows fly into the centre of Oxford so really close to urban population and so the farm constantly has a really heavy burden of population of rats um as many farms do but. I don't think I think it's particularly difficult there and they're, they're particularly evolved like they chew through metal so we remetalled the outside of the grain store they chewed through it and it was like wow okay well the only way I can now if I can't keep my grain store rat proof I the only thing is to not have grain but we've got chickens and how do we feed them and I just I just started asking because when I re then what I realized was that it wasn't the rats fault in fact the rats were actually really clever it was us we we were putting grain in grain stores perfect for them it's nice and warm and dry they can get in they can eat they can nest around the around the edges and I realized and then we spent all of our time and energy trying to get rid of the rats so then poisoning is the it's the thing most people do and but as someone who's kind of had a career in animal welfare was like god that's really bad like we feed them and then we poison them and that cycle just feels something about it is wrong and so yeah that and then that was the second thing I questioned and then I was like well how do we do this differently well let's not have grain so we have still got grain for the chickens but we moved away from grain for the cattle so we don't have that problem on on the, on the floor anymore i don't have the stress of trying to keep the rats out we don't we're not poisoning them um and and then yeah, as soon as you do a few things like that you then realize ah it's every 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 weight you lift off your shoulder you stand a little bit taller and it gives you you sort of think about another thing um so yeah mine started with lambs tags in the rain and rats basically was what started my journey so Essentially, the problem with the rats was that you were creating an imbalance in nature by having a lot of food for rats all in one place, and that wouldn't naturally happen. So, also, because um, I, I know, you know, I know that rats have something called neophobia. That they're they're very um, they're very conditioned to things being the same. So um, they don't like change. Um, so, did you find that? when everything's all in one place but if if you start moving things around does it change the behavior of rats because I, I think you you mentioned to me once before that when the chickens started being moved in like um chicken tractors the rat problem was gone because the rats will not it'll take them a while to be accustomed to where things are and they don't like change um so was that was that a, was, yeah tell me about that did that ha happen help yeah, that was um, so. Uh, um, whilst we were dealing with the, the the problem that we had with rats, we were working with this great guy um, who was um, he worked in rodent control because he wanted to try and work with people to help understand rat behaviour so that they could reduce ultimately reduce the amount of poisons that they used. And and so that yeah, never before had I thought about it any deeper than got a rat problem, kill the rats. Got a rat problem, kill the rats. And then it was that well why have we got the rats well we're providing shelter and food okay well what is it about you know what can I learn about rat behavior that you know how so let's remove the food let's remove some of the areas of shelter that we were providing and then um yeah and then it was this thing that I learned through that which was that they don't they don't like change and they're very nervous and actually that's what makes them a very good species because they don't put themselves in risky situations and um and, and I realized they were outsmarting me on every level but I did outsmart them yes because then what we realized was that yeah with with mo moving from static sheds and um i mean they were static but moved every year because they were on an organic system so right. moved every cycle but they were it, they were static long enough for rat population to build up around the sheds but with yeah we we, we built a, a mobile um chicken tractor and and we never had we never saw we never saw a rat um around that and it moved um the trailer moved every day um and the theory being that if we did suddenly get a build-up of rats we would just be able to move it to another area of the farm really easily so 
it's not like yeah we were moving it just along each day but that was enough that it, it put it put the rats off because one of the other things I did a little calculation one day was like well how much does a rat eat a day and then how many rats are there in the world if you do a loose calculation well I can't remember the millions but you know so millions and millions of tons of food um, that could be for human consumption are eaten every year by rats and we just don't even think about that as part of our food waste narrative so yeah we so it also costs it's one of the areas that means that you you know a little bit less food is wasted by feeding it to rats so yeah they they we never saw a rat and and still in other mobile systems it, i see that i see the same thing you, you don't get the rats there interesting so the number of rats obviously is going to be determined by their availability to by by the availability of food for them and if if there's a lot of food provided for them the population will increase accordingly i guess so if we can take that away everything will be more balanced yeah um, yeah uh, that's that's fascinating but but again it's like you described the in, in there you're talking about when you had the rat problem the obvious thing was lots of rats get rid of them and it's a very linear way of thinking and you came back from it from well asking the question well, why are there lots of rats and that, that's that to me is the interesting part of that is you were thinking further back up the chain not not for the you know kind of linear outcome um so obviously you've had this kind of realization that you wanted to be working regenerative systems and the term regenerative agriculture is, is almost becoming um, universally understood by the consumer now. Um, and I know there's a lot of problems with, with that because um, I think there's a lot of regenerative, um, the term regenerative is being used to describe an outcome in a particular field, which could be just linked to the buildup of carbon or, you know, an improve of biodiversity. And um, one of the big problems with it, and, and I've seen this even through some of the certifications, is that some of the practices that are allowed, quote unquote, within the regenerative system are far from regenerative in terms of the effects on the soil health and bringing in externalities from elsewhere. Um, so there is the potential for... I think you mentioned true cost accounting before when you were talking about um, the, sort of the food industry, this idea of where the costs kind of go down a line. Um, could you just tell me a little bit about what you, how, how, how can regenerative recover from this potential greenwash that's happening right now? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it, 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 it's really interesting. Like people, the word regenerative seems to make some people really angry and, um, and I didn't really know why. And um, when we when I first started working in this field of, you know, a, a, a food the producing food in a way that is it's not just about reducing harm. It's about actually we've we, we can't well we haven't achieved sustainability. And even if we did now, we've already done enough damage that we need to be regenerating. So, um, you know, it seemed to me like well let, let you know let's use the word regenerative, but it seems to make some people really cross. And I, I couldn't really work out. Why, why it angered people so much I think for some it was just because it was a change and and then I realized that um it, yeah it is because um it depending on your context of what the way that you use it it can just be used to to to, to scratch the surface so um the I, I was speaking on a on a panel with a a, a well-known organic farmer and he was almost um he was almost furious about what I was saying about regenerative agriculture. And I didn't really know why. And then I, I clocked. It's because within, um, for me, regener a, a, a truly a system that is is too, truly maximizing its ability to regenerate is doing it without the use of artificial chemicals. Because as soon as you're bringing an artificial chemical, you are knocking something out of balance. It might be for some that there is a need for that as we wean ourselves off the the, the current chemical system and onto a new one. But for some um it seems that for example glyphosate is now you know the the, the a, 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 a tried and tested like we have to have glyphosate as part of a regenerative system and people are actually starting to talk about regenerative in a way that is it can only work with glyphosate and then i, I would totally to totally disagree with that and um and that's why um you know we, we for, for me it was always in my head and we we talked about this at new foundation the other day and said that well this is why organic is our baseline we 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 wouldn't go anything less than chemical free and then what we wanted to do is build build regeneration on that um from from that organic baseline point um so you were talking there about 
the fact that within certain parameters, people are defining regenerative as a system that still uses chemicals. And you mentioned one chemical there, glyphosate, which is a particularly contentious um, contentious chemical because as I understand, it's, it's very useful, but also very harmful. Could you just talk to me about the pros and cons of glyphosate and also what is it? Yeah, so it's a kind of broad spectrum weed killer, I guess. It it, it kills um, it kills all weeds, which is great uh, if you need to get rid of weeds and also if you view them as weeds. But um, I see that this week the Royal Horticultural Society has actually said they're eradicating the word weeds um, from their from their from their vo- vocabulary and are actually now referred to as hero plants because I think that as what one thing that we all are learning is that we actually don't know very much at all and that weeds aren't there but to, to, they haven't been invented by mother nature to be a pain um to humans they're actually there with a purpose and so when a soil is saying it needs a certain thing then then the the, the, the seed bank of weeds or plants that are within that will express so for example a dock leaf or a thistle is very deep rooting so with compaction or um some with compaction deep roots will will come or um other things like cleavers would sp- cover ground very quickly so if you've got bare ground weeds will grow to cover ground because nature knows that bare ground will be vulnerable to soil erosion and carbon um being lost etc so um yeah uh glyphosate is a weed killer and it also has other other roles in um uh desiccating crops so drying crops off ahead of harvest and, and things like that so it, it, it has been very useful and it has been well, when, when you say drying crops off ahead of harvest what what is that does that mean you're actually you're putting a weed killer on the on the crop that we want to eat to kill it quickly so that it will dry in the sun is is that what you mean by drying out desiccate yeah so, so this, so this weed killer that kills all plants is being put on the food we eat right before it's harvested for us to eat it. Yeah, uh, not all food, not all. Um, certain crops, like um, it would be more commonly used in oilseed rape, for example, in the UK context. Um, less so used on on maybe wheat, um, but uh, would be used in certain times. So if it's a really damp, d- dry, uh, sorry, you know, a damp summer, and it was difficult to get it to ripen, it might be used to help. Um, might be used to help in in some on on some farms, not all, but yeah, it, that it, it it does have a use. Yeah, it does and, have a use there. <laughs> and is that because if you don't kill the plant, the seeds don't fully develop? Is that like accelerating a natural natural thing that the plant would do to fit your timing and weather patterns? Is that is that effectively what we're talking about here? Or yeah, in, in, in yeah, and in in oil seed rape, it sort of. Um, it, it dries everything else out so that the seeds come out nice you know it could come out easily um and, and i think that um yes that's where it it, it has a use and it, it serves that purpose very well and i think that like many of the things we've done in in our current food system it is it's the unintended consequences that we just didn't know about um and 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 of We've been told by the makers of um, of glyphosate for a long time that it's safe to the, to the point where many of them have drunk it to say it's so safe to drink because it um, and and the reason that like because I'm not definitely not a, a well I'm not a scientist to be able to explain this but my version of it is that it's safe enough to drink because um, what what um, what glyphosate does is it attacks the shikame pathway within a plant and humans don't have a shikame pathway but. What it does is it kills all microbes, and that's how it affects that shikame pathway. And what we increasingly understand is that um, uh, our gut microbiome is actually our second brain, or is the most fundamental thing to our health. And that what glyphosate does do um, is affect that. And that um, Dr. Zach Bush, for example, has done a lot of work to um, correlate the increase in endemic disease that we see with diabetes and um, cancers and um, some ADHDs, autism, other things like that um, can, can be linked to the increased use from about 1996 of glyphosate um, when it became a lot more mainstream in food production. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's what it is and what it does. It's an incredibly useful tool. Um, where it plays a role, it's, it's it's kind of this emerging role in a regenerative system is that um, 
when you um, want to plant a crop, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, a cover crop. So we, you know, one of the things we talk about is bare soil is not good. So we plant right. a cover crop. So we put a cover, we harvest the grain that we're going to take off, say the wheat, to so make bread. And then um, we, as part of our rotation, we might not then be planting anything else until the following spring. So we don't want that ground to be bare over the winter. Traditionally, we'd have left it bare and we'd have said, oh, it's good for the frost to break, break down the earth after we've ploughed it. But now we know that bare soil is not good um, because it's washing and blowing away. And so we want to cover it. So we plant a cover crop um, made up of um, some quick growing radish um, legumes and other other type things that will will grow really well and act as a great soil conditioner. They, they, they help break up the soil. They add organic matter to the soil and that's great. But when it comes then to wanting to plant your cereal again in the spring, how do you get rid of that cover crop? Um, and one, um, there's two options really, ploughing and killing it with weed killer and there's a third which is to graze it with animals but the way our agriculture system is currently set up people don't always have access to animals at the right time in the right numbers to become and graze that to the point where it's not going to affect the next crop so that the choice is plowing or glyphosate well plowing is killing the mycorrhiza of fungi it's turning over we know that that's not good we're turning over the soil we're exposing um seeds that can then germinate from uh, we, we get weeds um and, and and a way of doing it without disturbing the soil is to use is to use glyphosate that's what just one example of its is use in a regenerative system so for some it works really well and some would say well it's better to use glyphosate than it is to disturb the soil and i think that 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 is potentially true in that particular context but of course what we also know is that it, it might work better right there and then that field might be holding on to more mycorrhizal fungi it might suppress more carbon because they're not breaking out with the plow with the use of glyphosate but of course glyphosate doesn't it, it's it's water soluble so it doesn't stay in one place and it's running off and it's affecting our water courses um even the most deep aquifers are now finding traces of glyphosate and, and the reality is it's now part of our system it's in our breast milk and it's in our water and that we are at the same time dealing with health problems. And so we don't, we, you know, the, the links are becoming more apparent. And so as part of a system that is truly regenerating, and I guess that's a new foundation farms, we talk about deep regeneration. Mm. So it's not just about that one field having a bit a better soil carbon, you know, it's about the whole system and, and, and humans as a, as a keystone species as part of that system. So when we take, when we look at the whole system, we see that any chemical, is is not is is not going to contribute positively to a, a more kind of uh, a, a more natural system, and so we definitely kind of put a line in the sand in that we would we would do it without chemicals. So um, I know, like for example, I I I, I really like I enjoy bake, baking bread at home, and and because of glyphosate, I know that I always buy organic flour because I know glyphosate is banned within the organic system. So. But you've just described, so presumably the organic flour I'm buying, if they're using cover crops, they're having to plow them in, which is, you know, a different destructive tactic. Um, at New Foundation, we're trying to build soil no matter what. How are we going to do that without uh, using either glyphosate or plowing? Because grains are, you know, quite a useful crop. And, and I know that the system will be producing grain. So what's the, um, what's the tactic there? How are you going to do it? Well, it will depend on a farm by farm basis as to what the soil type is, what the previous cropping has been. It, 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 everything will be within context. But um, um, it will be uh, 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 one thing that we see as absolutely fundamental is integration of, of animals within the system. So we would have animals on hand to be able to support with the termination of a cover crop, for example. And then it might be a, a light cultivation um, and, and it might be a shallow plough or it might be, a, a you know, using other forms of cultivation. Um, and I think that um, but but also beyond that. So we, we, we want to grow grain, but we would be. Um, maybe more interested in growing grains that were um, more of the heritage traditional emma and einkorn type wheats that would have longer straw so that they would grow up ahead of um, have a higher height grow up higher so the weeds wouldn't be such a problem um, and and have um, a kind of different approach to the way that we would grow we wouldn't have such a focus on absolutely maximizing yield at all cost mm -hmm. it might be that yeah yield is of course important but so is making sure that we're maintaining the infiltration water infiltrating into our soil and the ability of our soil to hold onto water for example so yield will be a measure but it won't be the measure so, um, so it might be that you simply select a variety of wheat that grows taller than the other things that will naturally grow in the field yeah 
Wow, I mean, that's such a simple solution, right? Um, and when when you get, because when you get um, plants growing together, is there a system whereby they are helping each other or they're rather than, because the traditional system of, of, agrico of arable agriculture is to kill everything except for the plant that you want mm -hmm. um, so that nothing is competing for resources. How does that work then? If you're, if you're allowing... I, I don't like. I, I don't want to use the term weeds now because you told me not to. No, no. <laughs> as I understand it, the, the term weed weed means a plant, uh, a plant that's in the wrong place according to the system you're trying to do. So, wheat in a rose garden would be a weed, mm -hmm. um, whereas a thistle in a wheat field is a weed. It's just not where you want it. Um, but if we're if we're saying okay, there are no weeds in, in our system, we're going to let, we're going to do what we can within within natural systems without using chemicals. But um, are the, weed, the weeds going to be competing for the nutrients that the wheat needs, or are they going to be enhancing the system in which the wheat's growing, or is it a bit of both? Yeah, no, I, I think in enhancing. I think that, um, yeah, that, that's another kind of paradigm that we're starting to unpick with is this, this competition thing, as in you need to eradicate everything else. You need to eradicate everything else if you are applying expensive nitrogen that you have purchased that has come from a fertilizer manufacturer using natural gas in which to produce it using the methods they developed when making explosives during the First and Second World Wars. You know, that's where fertilizer comes from. And um, and, and so then, yes, when you are putting that on, um, you want to make sure that it is only your crop that is is <laughs> is making the most of that nitrogen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and other fertilizers. Um, Whereas um, I guess what we also know is that when you look at it, what we also know is that um, plants uh, actually it's about, it's about the interaction between them and the communication that happens and the, the use of mycorrhizal fungi to communicate between those things and to trigger reactions that means certain certain plants release certain minerals to all support e each other under the ground and so our key would be about having diversity so lots going on um and then you find that actually what what happens is that um yes it, it supports rather than takes away from um uh, from 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 each other and um there's also diversity in you know in, in, it could grow just wheat but you might grow lots of different varieties of wheat so that um so that if a particular fung fungus or mildew comes in for example but it will there'll only be certain varieties that will be more susceptible to that um and and of course there's a this thing about i mean in in the wine world we know it as as terroir don't we about that connection of the flavor of the soil and but there's 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 that the same the flavor is part of it but also it's about working with a piece of land and 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 identifying what what grows well there what's what sustains itself most easily and over time we won't know that to start with but over time that will that will start to build up we'll build a picture of which varieties which types and of course we'll you know have our own we will select our own and and and, and go and go from there but that that's that's a massive fundamental shift in in the kind of almost the core belief system of how to do farming when you're talking about encouraging cooperation rather than killing competition um and and the idea of stacking enterprise if you like even if that enterprise is is allowing pasture to grow underneath the wheat um that that goes against everything that traditional i'd call it conventional reductionist agriculture has always done where you want one thing so you kill everything else this is like saying you want one thing but it will do better if we allow it to be part of a natural system that that's a really is, is that the sort of mindset shift that new foundation is based on would that be a good analogy of of how the whole system is going to work yeah i think i think that's right i think that's why we call it radically natural it's radically different from what we currently do and i would just say on your point there about traditional of course it's traditional for the last hundred years it, it's mm. not traditional forever you know this is how um yes as part of the industrial revolution there had been a bit of ramping up of this type of farming but then it really came after the second world war with the 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 the, the, the mandate to grow more which was important coming out people were hungry we needed to do that we've been reliant on imports we needed not to be mm. but it was done with uh people were paid to grub up oak trees we just didn't appreciate um 
what what we were doing and and the use of the you know nitrogen fertilizer coming from bomb bomb manufacture oh they worked out this process it was great how do we make use of it now and um and 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 so it was great and it was productive and farmers were given seeds and fertilizer and they had these they grew crops and they'd never grown crops as quickly or as as, as fast and it was it was mind-blowing and it was brilliant progress it's that unintended consequences it's the thinking about when we think about things in isolation they might look great when we stand back and now we're, we're dealing with the unintended consequences of the last hundred years or so of that. And so it, it really actually isn't that far back that you have to go um, before we were, we were producing food. Um, we, we were producing food in, in, in a different way. And, um, and another part that just comes into this for me, which is, is something that, um, is this changing baseline syndrome and I actually talked to my dad about this the other day because he was farm farming in the 1970s and I said dad have you seen you know like a decline in the number of birds you know my dad can't get his head around the fact that we would be one of the most nature depleted countries in the world so we really like acknowledgement that we've not got it right is one of the hardest things to do actually because that was my story like I'm doing all the best practice everybody's telling me all the things I need to do but it's still not working and to to say to him well no I see low we've got loads of uh there's loads of pigeons I'm like yeah but there's just pigeons isn't there pigeons magpies and crows like what about all the other birds and he said you know what I've never I've never thought about it he said I remember ripping hedgerows out in the 1970s absolutely and he said um and you know what he said I never hear a woodpecker anymore. I used to always hear woodpeckers. And um, so it's, it's like this changing baseline. We don't realise how bad it's got because we only know a few years back. But even in my lifetime, I, from starting to drive at 17 to today at 42, um, you know, the, no insects on the windscreen, no people talk about that. But that's another element that comes into it about what even is, what even, where, where are we even at? Um, but yeah, so that's why ra- radically natural, I think is is the phrase that sums it up for me. It is radical. Yeah. Um, but it is very natural. Yeah, that's that's interesting. When you when you're putting into context the time scale of, of agriculture, that hundred years it's it's not very long, but it's long enough that no individual will remember the before and after now. So it's probably four generations, three three or four generations of farmers to get from A to B, and the changing baseline that you mentioned, even that, as rapid as it is in evolutionary terms. It's kind of awkwardly slow enough that we don't quite notice it year to year. Yeah, um, so so ne- this year isn't probably that different to last year, but it's probably different to 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. And that's hard to, for our brains to connect. Um, so I think, yeah, that's going to be really interesting to see as new foundation develops, if we can produce a system that, that completely shifts the baseline. Um, how... How long do you think it would be within, you know, within a, an area of land before, how quickly can that baseline change again, change back again if conditions are right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, traditionally we always were told it took 100 years to grow an inch of topsoil um, and things like that. And it, it, it would always feel like progress was going to be really slow. But actually, I think if you talk to most people adopting regeneration of some form um that actually they see the change really quickly and it and it's great because it motivates them to make more change and in in my experience what when we changed grazing from a we, we changed from set stock to rotational um to um holistic plan grazing or adaptive multi product grazing which would be a kind of the most regenerative that we know of to date mm-hmm. of of the grazing practices um the change was really rapid um and and a, and a good example would be just the number of insects we saw in letting grass grow and go to seed. You know, that's that's regarded as bad practice. To let grass grow and go to seed, you're failing on your grazing or your silage making if you've let grass go to seed. Um, but what we saw in one year, just in one not from from March through to July, was this massive influx of insects. I've got no idea what any of them was, but you walked through and it just buzzed like I've never heard buzz. And 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 that was just amazing. And then um very quickly um but the other thing that changed is the height at which things go to seed so we i'd watch these videos of the guys in america and they'd be walking through grass as tall as them and i'd be like how do they even get grass that tall like our grass doesn't even do it but what what we found from leaving these longer rest periods and and allowing grass to grow longer it's almost like we've taught grass to go to seed 
quite short because we're constantly grazing or cutting it because we never want it to the be the only chance it's got yeah. the only chance to go yeah, it, it, yeah we're instinctively everything's there to reproduce so the only way it can reproduce is putting seeds on when it gets to this high as soon as you give it that rest it kind of goes ah ah and it it's almost like the same as the weight falling off my shoulder as the weight falls off its shoulders it's almost and- like I, I can i can travel the world and have a career before i have kids yeah <laughs> exactly and it and it and it grows much longer and then you get what's above the ground is below the ground you've got deeper roots you've got more leaf matter for more photosynthesis free free energy don't need to buy it in a bag it's free it's there uh nitrogen what was it the air is made up of 70 something percent nitrogen let let the leaves do that themselves their carbon sequestering the deeper roots are going down they're breaking up compaction they're holding on to more water the whole thing changes and then you've got Maybe we, we didn't go into drought quite as quickly and, uh, you know, and, and, and that change. But within one year, the changes were there. Are we there yet? Will we ever get there? What are we getting to? It's it's one of those really cheesy, it's a journey, not a destination things. It's just about doing things a little bit better each year. Um, but but the changes happen within one season right, right in front of us. So I would expect that to happen on the farms that we're working with. New Foundation, each one will be different, but um, but the changes will be will be. It, it, it me, there'll be some change immediately amazing i really look forward to seeing that and we must be very careful between us all to make sure that we can in some way record the baseline and 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 the improvement on that um unless you've got anything else to add claire we've been on for an hour and a bit now which we weren't supposed to do but um no, anything... sorry i talked no no, so no, much. no 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 i love it i love it well i've got i've got loads of bits and pieces um that are of great use so um i look forward to kind of listening back and picking some bits out uh, anything else you want to add in? Do you think we've covered off everything you want to talk about? Yeah, no, I think that's a good, um, a good, a good, yeah, good cover off. Um, yeah, no, nothing to add from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. No worries. No worries. No worries.